Rock and roll history is broad and complex, and it's filled to the brim with tragedy, joy, and drama, so nobody could blame you for forgetting about the deaths of these iconic rock stars. When Rolling Stone profiled Emerson, Lake, and Palmer in 2016, the magazine described them as audacious, virtuosic, progressive rock icons, and they're absolutely right. It's impossible to imagine what the industry would be like had this trio not come together to give the world their unique brand of genre-spanning music. That same year, on March 10th, Keith Emerson died. According to his girlfriend, Emerson took his own life after nerve pain in his hands began impacting his ability to play, and fans started harassing him on social media about it. In an interview, she revealed more about the stress that upcoming performances had placed him under, saying, He didn't want to let down fans. He was a perfectionist, and the thought he wouldn't play perfectly made him depressed, nervous, and anxious. Emerson's death was followed by that of fellow ELP co-founder Greg Lake later that same year. Lake's manager announced, Yesterday, December 7th, I lost my best friend to a long and stubborn battle with cancer. Tributes flooded in as others in the music industry roundly agreed that he had always stayed true to the quote found on his official website. The greatest music is made for love, not for money. Of his generation of rock and roll performers, Jeff Beck was known as the guitarist guitarist. Among the general public, his reputation was more muted. Beck never had a permanent musical home during his career as a guitarist. He got a start with the Yardbirds, but soon fell out with his bandmates. His efforts to form his own group were short-lived, though the first Jeff Beck group established a bountiful musical relationship with Rod Stewart. And opportunities to join such legendary acts as the Rolling Stones were passed over. He's like a kid in a toy shop with his guitar uh, and his riffs. Can you do this? And I go, no. That said, Beck's relatively subdued public profile compared to his peers was by design as much as by chance. For Beck, the priority was always his musicianship, rather than the archetypal rock star notoriety. His instrumental work was renowned in musical circles, and he experimented with various styles over the years, demonstrating a range unmatched by most other artists. And he was a popular guest artist with other acts, too, in between lengthy retreats from the spotlight when the fame just didn't feel right. He once claimed that he had no regrets whatsoever and kept up his unconventional career until January 10, 2023, when he died of bacterial meningitis at age 78. Mark Lanigan helped to define grunge music. His somber vocals were a calling card of the Screaming Trees from their inception in 1984 to the band's dissolution in 2000. He maintained a solo career at the same time, performing with fellow grunge luminary Kurt Cobain and generally laying out a blueprint for the entire genre. In the last years of his life, Lanigan turned to prose. His first book, I Am the Wolf, Lyrics and Writings, was released in 2017. It was largely composed of stories behind song lyrics he had provided over the years. He followed it up with a memoir, Sing Backwards and Weep, in 2020, and another memoir the following year. If two memoirs within a year seem excessive, it's only because Lanigan had experienced enough in 2020 to write a book's worth of new material. Namely, his experience with COVID-19 almost killed him. Lanigan was in the hospital for months, suffered nightmarish hallucinations, and had to go into a medically induced coma before recovering. In Devil in a Coma, he wrote, The doctors told my wife I held the record for the longest stay in this condition to survive at this institution. Lanigan eventually returned to his home in Killarney, Ireland, where he died at 57 on February 22, 2022. His cause of death was not disclosed. Meatloaf enjoyed one of the most successful careers in the history of rock and roll. Born Marvin Lee a day, his album Bad Outta Hell is still one of the best-selling records of all time. His manic energy on stage bonded him with fans, too, even through lean years of record sales and multiple health scares. And generations of late-night moviegoers no doubt saw him brutally killed by Tim Curry in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. One from the vaults. In his later years, Meatloaf became outspoken on a variety of issues, espousing unproven or disproven claims about climate change and safety measures designed to counteract the COVID-19 pandemic. He specifically challenged mask mandates in an interview with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. At the end of the interview, he said, If I die, I die, but I'm not going to be controlled. In early January 2022, Meatloaf's daughter, Pearl Day, posted on her Instagram that several members of her family outside of her immediate household had tested positive for COVID. Meatloaf's death on January 20th was announced shortly after. While no cause of death was given, rumors quickly spread through tabloids that he had died from the coronavirus. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards are the names most commonly associated with the Rolling Stones. Nevertheless, Brian Jones played just as important a part in the beginning of the band's history. Besides being a founding member of the group, he was a multi-talented instrumentalist who provided a wide range of sounds on the Stones' earliest recordings, from guitar to harmonica to clarinet. Not only that, but Jones was the most likely of the founding trio to engage with the press, often angrily. 
and more than anyone else in the band, he indulged most heavily in the excesses of a rock star's life. Jones's heavy drug use led to his arrest in 1967, and he was handed a suspended sentence of nine months in jail. In the years since, Jones's ex-bandmates have called him difficult and unpleasant to work with. He was two things. He was not very nice, and he upset people very easily. He wasn't very pleasant, I mean. As Jagger gained more attention as the group's singer, and as he and Richards began their songwriting collaboration, Jones struggled with jealousy and control issues. In 1969, he was cast out of the band he had formed. That same year, Jones was found dead in his swimming pool. He was just 27 years old. Despite rumors of murder, the cause of death was ruled to have been misadventure. When two different Beatles needed a skilled and versatile drummer for their first major solo albums, they both sought out the services of Alan White. While still a teenager, White played with Joe Cocker before getting a call in 1969 from John Lennon to become a member of the Plastic Ono Band. His work on Instant Karma, Imagine, and Jealous Guy launched White to a new level of fame. And through Lennon, he met George Harrison, who hired the drummer to play on his 1970 triple album All Things Must Pass. From there, White settled in as the man behind the kit for the already successful progressive rock band Yes, ultimately replacing original member Bill Bruford. The Yes lineup was changed often, but White stuck with them throughout, anchoring the group through their ambitiously weird 70s albums and into their radio-friendly pop era in the 80s. Following a short period of illness, White died on May 26, 2022. The drummer was 72 years old. Boston began as a studio creation. Tom Schultz, a mechanical engineer at Polaroid, played in bands during his off hours and recorded demos in his home basement studio. Schultz wrote, engineered, produced, and played everything but drums on those first Boston recordings, bringing in Brad Delp to fill the crucial role of lead singer. Signed by Epic Records on the auspices of being an actual live band, Schultz made Delp the frontman of Boston, and his bright, soaring, multi-octave range made classics out of songs such as More Than a Feeling and Peace of Mind. Released in 1976, Boston's self-titled debut album has sold 17 million copies. Almost the entire LP still gets regular airplay on classic rock radio, along with latter Boston tracks like Don't Look Back and the number one hit power ballad Amanda. Schultz's devotion to perfection meant Boston albums were few and far between, however. LPs hit stores in 1976, 1978, and 1986. Delp filled the downtime and occasional hiatus on assorted projects with Boston bandmate Barry Goudreau and Keith Emerson. On March 9, 2007, Delp's body was found at his home in New Hampshire. An investigation, toxicology report, and the emergence of a note led authorities to rule the death a suicide. Delp was 55 years old. Leonard Skinner brought Southern rock to the masses. Combining hard-charging heavy rock sounds with folk and country elements, Leonard Skinner's entrancing and danceable sound led to radio staples such as Sweet Home Alabama, What's Your Name, and Freebird. A major part of Skinner's unique sound came from the soulful, technically proficient instrumental work and songwriting of founding guitarist Gary Rossington. Following four studio albums and a popular live record, Leonard Skinner endured a horrific tragedy on October 20, 1977. While on the road to promote their latest LP, Street Survivors, the band took a charter plane out of Greenville, South Carolina to fly to a show in Louisiana. While over Mississippi, the aircraft ran out of gas, and an emergency landing went awry, sending the plane crashing into a forested area. Both pilots died, as did Leonard Skinner singer Ronnie Van Sant, guitarist Steve Gaines, backup singer Cassie Gaines, and road manager Dean Kilpatrick. It was just a disaster to me. I've never seen anything like it. And uh, it just hit me hard. The surviving members of Leonard Skinner reunited in 1987 to record and tour in various iterations, always with Rossington at the forefront. Rossington was the last original member of Leonard Skinner. He suffered a heart attack in 2015 and underwent emergency surgery for cardiac issues in 2021. On March 5, 2023, Rossington died at the age of 71. The Eagles emerged from the Los Angeles country rock scene in the 60s and 70s, having previously served as Linda Ronstadt's backing band. The band's bassist, Randy Meisner, was a founding member who had come off the back of a stint with Rick Nelson's Stone Canyon Band. Lead vocal duties in the Eagles rotated, and Meisner contributed his angelic tenor to the 1975 hit Take It to the Limit, a song he also co-wrote. Meisner played on every Eagles album from 1972 to 1977, a span that produced two of the top three best-selling LPs ever, Eagles, Their Greatest Hits, and Hotel California, moving 38 million and 26 million copies respectively. However, Meisner's reluctance to live in the spotlight, as well as difficulty singing those high notes on Take It to the Limit every night, led to some of the band's many fights. He departed the Eagles in 1977 for a solo career in the 80s, which included rock hits such as Deep Inside My Heart and Hearts on Fire. On July 27, 2023, the Eagles website announced that Meisner had died the previous evening in Los Angeles from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The bassist and singer was 77. 
At just 16 years old, Canadian singer and guitarist Robbie Robertson became a member of the Hawks, the backing band for 50s rockabilly performer Ronnie Hawkins. Within five years, the Hawks had dropped Hawkins to go back up Bob Dylan while he toured during his electric period. Then the band went out on their own again, renaming themselves The Band and scoring a record deal. In the late 1960s, albums music from Big Pink and the band combined folk, rock, and American roots music to create a lush anthemic sound that presaged the singer-songwriter movements of the 1970s. Robertson was a cheap creative voice in the band. Not just a singer and guitarist, he wrote the band's most famous tunes, including The Wait, Up on Cripple Creek, and The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. The band had their final concert in 1976 film, and that recording, The Last Waltz, earned acclaim as one of the best concert movies ever made. The film's director, some guy named Martin Scorsese, would seek out Robertson to score or select music for several of his movies. Over the years, Robertson made music for Raging Bull, Gangs of New York, The Wolf of Wall Street, and Killers of the Flower Moon. Following a lengthy illness, Robertson died on August 9, 2023 in Los Angeles. The rock musician and film composer was 80 years old. If you or someone you know is struggling or in crisis, help is available. Call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org.